Romans chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I'm reading out of the Amplified. If you don't have it in the Amplified, don't worry about it. If you do not have a copy of our notes, raise your hand. Our ushers will come even while we're standing here to make sure you have them. It is important that you have a copy of our notes. Take them home because you're going to bring them back on Wednesday night and we're going to encourage one another together. So raise your hands real high. Keep them up. We're going to read though. It reads this way. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk, live in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons for the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction uh, of strongholds inasmuch we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ the Messiah the anointed one I thought for this month developing spiritual disciplines this is part two everybody shout this is part two you may be seated in the presence of the Lord we we start by saying uh, to you that it is important for us that if we're going to to ever become what God has called us to become it is crucial that we understand that God has called us to become someone something he has called us to become children of God sons of the Most High God not to be what you and I used to be not to be led and and, and manipulated and entangled again by our flesh or by the yoke of bondage that we used to be entangled in. I wish I had an amen right there. But he has called us out of darkness into light so that we will no longer be children of darkness behaving as the world behaves but so that we shall become children of light watch this who shines in the midst of darkness showing and saying to the world this is the way out of the dark entanglement and entrapments that you have been entangled and entrapped by somebody shout all right then with that said it is important that as Christians we began to develop certain disciplines so that we are watch this working intentionally to become what God has called us to become it is not enough for us to just come and say hey I'm a Christian because I confess Jesus as my Savior no it is now time that I start to exercise in this thing so that when the enemy comes in like a flood God is able to lift up a standard against him that standard being the very God that we we are developing inside of us somebody shout yes Lord and so then as we said on last week if I want to become physically fit if I want to become stronger tomorrow than I am today it is not enough for me to just think about being fit I must get in the gym and start to exercise to become more fit somebody shout we hear you if I want a deeper relationship with my wife it is not enough for me to just think about a deeper relationship I must start doing some activities to make sure that our relationship gets deeper grows closer everybody shout all right then if I want to be better with handling my money I must create something called a budget put God at the top of it and start to exercise in that thing so that I can become a better steward over what God is blessing me with everybody shout we got it now and if that is true about money and if that is true about relationships and if that is true about my physical body that is also so true about your spiritual man you will not become what God has called you to become just because you show up at a service once a week you must be, learn to develop some disciplines so that you can identify with the writer of 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 when he says hey beloved we are in a war and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they are not what they used to be we don't behave the way we used to behave but the weapons of our warfare are mighty through 
God to the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of imaginations and reasonings and every lofty thing that would exalt itself a higher than what you are getting to know God to be. High five your neighbor and tell him I'm getting to know God myself even now. So we define spiritual disciplines as intentional, strategic, developmental exercises that nurture spiritual health, health and foster spiritual growth. We said to you that in Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 part B that the Bible says they that know their God, Daniel 11 32, they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The reason that is so important is because when we talk about spiritual disciplines, when we talk about what we're asking you to learn to do last week, this week, and next week, what we're saying to you is that as you learn to do these things, you're going to become, watch this, more uh, uh, intimate with God. You're going to develop a qualitative relationship with God. What that means when we talk about qualitative relationship, it means that you uh, literally start to tingle a little bit at the thought of being in his presence. Yeah. Toes get a little, little buzz through them. Knees get a little weak. I feel so weak in the knees. I can hardly speak. I look, y'all like Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, ever done. Somebody shout the best thing I've ever done. I took y'all way back. Some of you don't even know how far back. But, but, but what I'm trying to tell you is that when you walk with God, you'll not only get weak at the thought of a physical person, but you'll start to get weak. You'll start to cry. You'll start to get emotional about being in the presence of your spiritual lover because being with him becomes more important than the, even breath, than the breath you even breathe. Somebody shout, I want to know him that way. And when you get to know him like that, and as you spend time with him, guess what happens? You leave out of here, and the enemy shows up to try to trap you the way he used to trap you, and something inside of you says to you, you're different now. Hallelujah. Something inside of you says, you, you may, and watch this, you may be in the same body, but you are not the same person. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wish I had some people that are in the same body, but you are not the same person you used to be. And so then, as we learn these disciplines, what we're asking you to do is every week start to exercise in these disciplines so that you can become what God has called you to become. Let's learn the first discipline of the day. Y'all ready? The first discipline is what we're going to call the discipline of fasting. Everybody shout fasting. Say it again. Say it one more time. In the definition of fasting that we give you, what we did was we tried to highlight to you that the biblical definition of fasting has always included two things that you must do in order to biblically fast. Uh, two aspects of fasting that are crucial, and we included those two aspects in the definition so that there is no misunderstanding of what we are communicating. A biblical fast has always incorporated two things. One is an abstain from food and two is the abstaining from food for the purpose of giving yourself to prayer if you have not abstained from food and given yourself to prayer you have not biblically fasted now the reason I share that is because I know it is popular today to, to say that I'm going on a fast and I'm fasting from social media or I'm fasting from my telephone or I'm fasting from TV and all of that and all of that's good but just let's be clear when the Bible calls a fast the Bible is calling for an abstaining from food are y'all listening to me because God just has a way of making sure that that we uh, get to the root of the matter and that is our own appetites and if we can control our natural appetite hallelujah hallelujah then God can get control of our spiritual appetites and if we can keep ourselves from eating at any table in the natural then God can keep us from eating anywhere in the spiritual somebody shout yes Lord say it again and so then it has always been about your appetite and what you are eating and putting in yourself. And God says, I need you to abstain from what you're putting in you 
so that you can give yourself to praying that you will become what I'm asking you to become and be able to accomplish what I'm asking you to accomplish. Somebody shout, I hear you. And so then what we have to learn to do is to learn the discipline of fasting. Somebody shout, the discipline of fasting. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is in a foreign land. He is in a foreign land, has been there for a term of over 70 years. He has been studying his word, and he realizes that this is the hour. It is the, at the end of the 70 years, a new king is in place. And, he, the, and then he records these words in chapter 9, verses 3 through 5 in the Amplified. And I set my face to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications. Watch this. With fasting and sackcloth and ashes and I pray to the Lord my God and made confession and said O oh Lord the great and dreadful God who keeps covenant mercy and loving kindness with those who love him and keep his commandments and then watch the confession we have sinned and dealt perversely and done wickedly and have rebelled turning us aside from your commandments and ordinances somebody shout Lord have mercy yeah so when you are Fasting, when you are fasting and praying, you are abstaining so that you can be able to confess that, hey, God, this is bigger than my physical appetite. My spiritual appetite has gotten out of control. I've been running after stuff I shouldn't have run after. I've gotten myself hungry for something you asked me to abstain from. So I'm here to confess to you that I'm sorry. Now help me to get back on the right track so that what I've been asking you for can surely come to pass yeah hallelujah. hallelujah hallelujah and so then jesus as he is making ready to begin his ministry in matthew chapter 4 the bible says that before he started his ministry in matthew chapter 3 he shows up are y'all listening to me today he shows up at this pool at this at this river jordan and he says to john the baptist baptize me john says i cannot you are the son of god he says hey suffer it to be so now and john baptizes him and john says when he came up watch what he says he says i saw the spirit descend upon him like a dove and i heard a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well please and after god had declared this is my beloved son jesus had to go and become that son are y'all listening to me and so it is not enough to have the endorsement of heaven of, over your life you got to tap into the grace of heaven to become what heaven has said you are thy will be done in earth as it is so heaven is speaking about you the question is, will you become disciplined enough to become what heaven is saying? It is not calling you what you were. It is not calling you who you used to be. It is not holding your past trespasses against you. It is saying, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Now let's become disciplined enough to say, God, I'm not that today. And I'm sorry. And I'm willing to abstain from some stuff. In order to see your power work in me. Jesus is on his way to becoming what his dad had told him he was. And the Bible says, after being baptized, his father endorsed him from heaven in Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says that immediately after that, Jesus went on a 40-day fast. Now, I ain't telling you to go on a 40-day fast. That was Jesus. But I'm telling you that sometimes you need to abstain from a meal or two. Are y'all listening to me? Not just for the purpose of saying I abstain from a meal or two. Not just to lose some weight here and there. But I'm talking about to give yourself the prayer. Somebody shout yes Lord. Say it again. And so then Jesus fasted for 40 days. And the Bible says after he had fasted. Watch this. The enemy says oh man he's weak now. Watch this. He abstained from, his, from feeding his flesh. So now he's weak. But what the devil didn't realize that although he was abstaining from feeding his flesh, the whole time he was fasting from fleshly desires, he was feeding his spiritual man. Hallelujah. And so where the enemy thought, I can trap him now, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Somebody shout, I want that kind of power. 
Yeah, and when you walk with God and when you give up some stuff for God, you can make sure that God will replace those voids. He will fill those voids with his power and give you supernatural strength to be what he's asked you to be and do what he's asked you to do. Somebody shout hallelujah. High five your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, this week, I just might, if the Lord tells me to, see a fast coming. I want you to note, and I put in your um, notes that, that Jesus said that some things require fasting and prayer. What did I tell you the two aspects of fasting were? Abstaining from food and giving yourself to prayer. And Jesus' disciples were brought a little boy by his daddy who was being tossed to and fro by the devil. He brought the boys to the disciples because he didn't want to bother Jesus. And it's in your notes in Mark chapter 9. And, and the disciples thought that just because they came to church, that meant that they had power over every devil. Thought that they could just cast the devil out. But it didn't come out. And Jesus finds out about it by the boy's daddy. Because Jesus is doing his business. And the boy's daddy says, Master, my son, he's been tossed to and fro all over the place. And I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. And Jesus looked around and he rebukes them. He said, oh, ye a little faith. How long have I been with you? What I love about it is the question he's asking them is how long have you been watching me give myself to fasting? Give myself to praying? You don't think I just walk around with this power by osmosis, do you? I'm not operating as God in the earth. I'm operating as a man empowered by God in the earth. And so he casts the devil out the man tells the man his faith has made him whole and his disciples get along with him Elder Carlo and in verse 28 of Matthew ch Mark chapter 9 they say okay rabbi why couldn't we do it and they were just sincere they were broken and Jesus in verse 29 says because this kind requires hallelujah fasting and prayer hallelujah so I told you last week you can't give up on prayer. Now I'm taking you a step further. While you're praying, if it's been a while, maybe it's time to turn that plate over and say this kind is going to come about by fasting and prayer. Before you give up on a family member, maybe it's time to add fasting to your prayer. Before you give up on that career change or on that promotion, maybe it's time to say this kind is only going to come by fasting and prayer. High five your quiet neighbor and tell them this kind may require what? It may take longer than your typical five minute prayer. It may take longer than your ride to work. It may take some quiet time in a quiet place so that you can experience what the psalmist was saying. In Psalms 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Somebody shout, all right then. Say it again. So then, discipline number two. Discipline number two. Everybody shout, discipline number two. Y'all didn't like number one, so I'll go to number two. But I'm trying to tell you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And before we break down and let the enemy rack us with depression and, and low self-esteem and everything else because of what hadn't happened, why don't we turn over a plate or two and let's say, let's get in the face of God and let's let God have the final say so. Somebody shout, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Discipline number two is the discipline of forgiveness. Because I think for too many of us, we think that long as, as long as I come to church and I get busy in church, God don't care anything about how I treat folk, especially those who hurt me, especially those who have wounded me. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something, that, that forgiveness is not a one-time thing. It is a lifetime thing. It is something you have to discipline yourself to do because the flesh will get an attitude in a minute. I said the flesh will get an attitude in a minute. You tell the truth in here. The flesh will get an attitude in a minute. And, and, and in a, thank you, Sister Keisha, in a second. And, and the flesh will feel entitled to the right to be unforgiving. 
they hurt me. And especially after you were there for them. The nerve of you. Are y'all listening to me? And especially after you gave them your best. The nerve of them. And yet the Bible asks us to learn to exercise in forgiveness. Because God wants our warfare to be mighty through God. And not to be fleshly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. So when I talk about the discipline of forgiveness, I'm talking about the act of giving up resentment or letting go of an offense and literally to pardon, to let the offender go. Somebody shout, let him go. Let him go. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter number six. You know the verse. We talked about it last week. Well, watch what he says in verses 12 through 15. And forgive us. He told us to pray this way and forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven, left, remitted, and let go of the debts and have given up resentment against our debtors. And lead, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Jesus, after he says amen, which means it's settled, I'm done praying. He says, for if you forgive people their trespasses. Their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now watch what Jesus says, verse 15. But if you do not learn the discipline of forgiving others, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Help us. Help us. I said, help us. So what God, what Jesus says is, walking in unforgiveness is too costly. It costs too much. Yes, you've been wounded. Yes, you've been hurt. But so was Jesus. He let it go. He let it go. So must you. Yes, you've been lied on. So was Jesus. Yes, you've been talked about. So was Jesus. Yes, you've experienced rejection, so did Jesus. Are y'all listening to me? Yes, you've been, I'm talking about, yes, you've been made a mockery of, but so is Jesus. And he's your example, and if he can let it go, you too must let it go. I feel like singing the Frozen song in here. Y'all know y'all are thinking it, so I said, you know, I might as well go with you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 through 32, it reads this way. I have to hurry up. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, marked, branded as God's own, secured for the day of redemption, a final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. Watch this. Let all bitterness. Now it's teaching you how to exercise here, how to let it go. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper and resentment. Anger, animosity, and quarreling, brawling, clamor, contention, and y'all, y'all, y'all learning it? Somebody shall teach us, but Lord, teach us. And slander. Watch this. Evil speaking, abusive or blasphemous language. Be banished from you with all malice, spite, ill will, or baseness of any kind, and become useful and helpful and kind to one another tender-hearted compassionate understanding loving-hearted forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you hallelujah I said hallelujah I know you think you got a right to stand out there in that parking lot and gossip about what went wrong today. But, but, but the Bible says that's how you get yourself caught up in unforgiveness. When you let bitterness and evil speaking and malice and ill will become a part of your lifestyle. But if you want to exercise in walking in forgiveness, put off bitterness, put off malice, put off ill speaking and learn to exercise and walk in being useful 
adding value to the service. Hallelujah. And so rather than become a specialist about what went wrong today, what if we became specialists about what went right? Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. Become useful. Stop grieving the spirit. Every time you leave out of here, you can't wait to get on the phone and talk about what you didn't like. How they messed it up. But yet you brought nothing of use to the service. Become useful. I didn't say it. The Bible did. That, somebody thought that's the book. Yeah. So I want you to note, and I put in your notes, Jesus said that forgiveness is a contingency to being forgiven. I want to say it again. Jesus said that forgiveness is a contingency to being forgiven. Now I want you to think about who has hurt you the most, disappointed you the most. And I want you to think about how many times the enemy has tried to convince you it's okay to act ugly and be unkind and treat them with ill intent. And I want you to just let that go right now in this house. Because we've got to learn to walk in forgiveness because unforgiveness costs us too much. It's a discipline that we must exercise in every day. Hallelujah. The last discipline before I take my seat is what we're going to call the discipline of faith. Everybody shout the discipline of faith. We call this discipline complete trust or confidence in God. It's believing God regardless of the circumstance or situation. It is a discipline that we must have. Everybody shout a discipline we must have. It is a discipline we must have that every day we wake up, we say, you know what, God, I choose to trust you. I choose to grab hold of faith. Now, there are some days the enemy catches us and we're not walking in faith. Y'all tell the truth and shame the devil. There are some circumstances that catch us in life and we're not walking in faith. But we can become disciplined in doing so. We, we've got to learn to acknowledge when faith is not present and then run back, pick it up. And say, I choose to believe God, even though this situation don't look good. Somebody shout, yes, Lord. See, what happens when you hook these disciplines up with last week's disciplines is now you understand that faith, that peace we were talking about, that peace is only going to stay present as you learn this discipline of catching and walking and living in faith. Because the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. So Jesus is walking with his disciples and he curses a fig tree. You know the story in Mark chapter 11 and he curses the tree and he keeps going because the tree is acting as if it is something it's not. And Jesus curses the tree. He keeps going and on the way back a few days later past the tree, his disciples are amazed that what he has spoken has come to pass. Y'all listening to me? His disciples are amazed that what has come out of his mouth has truly come to pass. And that's where the story picks up. And Jesus replying said to them, Mark eleven twenty two, tell me what he says. Have faith in God when? Do not miss that. It is a discipline. Not just come down and believe in God on Sunday. Because Monday's coming. Don't just believe in God on Monday. Because Tuesday's coming. Don't just believe in God when it comes to paying your tithes today. Believe in God when it comes to your marriage tomorrow. Believe in, don't just believe in God in your marriage. Believe in God as it, comes, as it relates to your children. Just every area of your life, you must bring faith to the table or else you're going to find yourself living less than God has intended for you to live. Hallelujah. So shake somebody and tell them have faith. Say it again. Truly I tell you, verse 23, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. For this reason, I am telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, you must bring faith to your prayer closet. Trust and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. 
And whenever you stand praying, you can't pray effectively unless you forgive. If you have anything against anybody, please let it go. Drop it. Leave it. In order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. In Romans 10, 17, the Bible says, Minister Rick, so faith comes by hearing what is told and what is heard comes from preaching of the message that came from the lips of Christ, the Messiah himself. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so I don't just make up faith. I discipline myself by getting in the word of God and developing faith because faith comes by and hearing what comes from the lips of Jesus. You want to know why I give you so many scriptures every week? Because faith comes by hearing. You know why I ask you to take the notes home and study them? Because faith comes by and the enemy knows that faith comes by hearing. And that's why he wants you around people who are talking about what can't be. What won't happen. What didn't happen last time. He wants you around people that build negative faith in you. But God says no. As long as you are hearing the word. As long as you are in the word. You will develop spiritual faith. And in Mark chapter 9 verse 23 I believe it is. Jesus says, I put in the note part of this particular point, that Jesus says, all things are possible to him or her who just simply keeps believing. Who just keeps believing. Because as we sit here right now, the one thing the enemy is after is your belief. He don't mind you sitting in church today. He does not mind you standing and singing. He just don't want you to believe it. He does not mind the fact that you have gotten dressed up and come here today. He just don't want you to believe it matters. He does not mind the fact that you are standing facing a cross right now. He just don't want you to believe it happened for you. But the devil is a liar. I said the devil is a liar. And no matter where I am. And what I'm going through, I am learning every day to discipline myself in faith. I believe you, God. I know I'm shedding tears and yes, anxiety is trying to take over. But that's why I wanted to confess, I believe you, God. And yes, it has been hurtful and painful. And yes, I've even misspoken some things. That's why I'm turning my plate over. And that's why I'm coming back to repent in prayer. I do believe you, God. And the discipline of faith is not about being perfect and never saying the wrong thing. It's just about making sure once you mess up and once you walk in doubt and unbelief, you get back and say, hold up. I still believe you, God. And before I take another step in doubt and another step in unbelief, I want to hit my knees and say I believe. Over my circumstance, over the people that are talking to me, over the people who don't believe God, I believe God. And I don't know what you're facing. And I don't know what you're going through. But I wonder if you would lift your hands and at least shout as loud as you can, I believe you, God. No, do it again. Tell him I believe you, God. For some of you it is healing. I want you to shout it. I believe you, God. For some of you it's deliverance and the enemy is trying to convince you you can't be delivered. But I want you to shout, I believe you, God.